and NVIDIA. Game number two about to begin here in a second between MVP Black, currently leading 1-0 against Team Freedom. And I think, you know, our commentators stated it very well that, that if there was any time to really start saying, maybe we should pick a map and maybe we should figure out some of our pocket strategies, it's absolutely now for Team Freedom. I mean, what screams to mind for me will be Tales of Doom. Tales of Doom is a map that they find a lot of success on. You've got the idea of a Lucio, the Abathur. Abathur, typically speaking, is banned away uh, by MVP Black. They don't want to deal with that global pressure. But this is a hero that does allow you to, in some degree, win that solo matchup. We talk about Cure and Rich, their interaction together. If you've got that Abathur hat there, suddenly that's a matchup where you say, look, Rich, yeah. you're not going to have all the time in the world to exert that 1v1 flair that you you uh, are so famous for, I suppose. And Makes a name sense. that always comes up, of course, is someone like Rich, who we can take a look at in a bit more closer detail, kind of under the microscope, as it were. And be, be, let's be honest, a lot of people tout him as the best player in the world, one of the best players in the world. He came back to MVP Black, and so far they've been on an absolute tear with Rich on their side. Yeah, yep. some people might say he was the best player in the world even when he was retired. <laughs> 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 Nothing was more exciting for me than when we had a chance to talk to him at Eastern Clash number two. And I asked him, I said, when was the, the time that you decided I'm coming back? Mm. He said, it was around April, but when I saw my team lose to L5, now mm -hmm. Ballistics, he's like, that's what I knew. Like, yeah. I had to come back, and he has come back in dominant fashion. Yeah, he definitely has. On the Ragnaros in that previous game, not exactly the most common hero nowadays, but an extremely strong performance, Grubby, that, again, we mentioned, they just have to be bulletproof, it feels like, against some of, the, against, you know, some of these teams like Team Freedom. Yeah, and this is what MVP Black essentially was. A big reason that Ragnaros performed poorly in the last half year or so is because they get greedy. They're winning their lane, they're pushing out yeah. deep, trying to get some little value, and they would get ganked, and they would get taken down by aggressive rotations. Now what I think we are seeing is the evolution of the old 4-1 split. Four heroes mid-top, one bottom. That's not true anymore. MVP Black here, putting two members in the bottom lane, uh, really are taking care of that uh, fragility of that deep pushing Ragnaros, and they're really helping it win rate. Let's head over to see which battleground we are going to be on now. We're expecting a Team Freedom choice, perhaps, as they take us oh, to yeah. Braxis Hold Down. There's not too much surprise here. I mean, I, both, I mean, me and Jayhawk just look at each other and go, yeah, we know this is coming, right? Warhead Junction, it's off the map. That is an NA special. Braxis Hold Down, also uh, an American special, right? So this is their time to try and bust out that Zaya, bust out that Morales, go for that push. No. I, I was looking at you guys too, but you didn't see me. Oh, <laughs> left out. <laughs> we'll, we'll look back at you now. No, but if you actually go back historically, Korea and teams, they generally ban this out. They're like, we want yeah. nothing to yeah. do with it. It is particularly interesting because we generally do see a 1 4 split, a little bit more traditionally. You might see some tricks here. We'll see if that skirmish does in, go in favor of Team Freedom. Let's get into it then. The draft begins for game number two here. Currently, MVP Black leads 1 0. Team Freedom has to win this to keep their hopes alive at BlizzCon. Braxis hold out the least played map alongside Warhead Junction. Is there a blessing in the result here coming up for Team Freedom? And one thing I would like to see Team Freedom do is either to draft heroes that are more multi-dimensional or more one-dimensional. Now that may seem like a contradiction, but they either gotta go for something very cheesy or let's say not cheesy but very uh, targeted. Really follow up with a plan and just do it. You're down 0-1 yeah. against MVP Black, arguably the number one favorite of the tournament. I couldn't agree with you more. You've got to stick to your plan, stick to your guns. If you're going to do it, then go, by all means, go out with a bang if you have yeah. to. I mean, go out, grab yourself a Kerrigan like temp Tempo and surprise some people, right? Just fully commit. Whatever it is, just fully commit. And we'll see what Team Freedom does. And the interesting thing here is we see two supports banned out. Ariel's been a high priority for Freedom, although they're taking it off the board. Yeah, and that then begs the question, are they going to go for that Tesla early adaption? No, they're not. Wow, Genji. ETC and Genji going to come off straight away. It does spring to mind. Brightwing has been really that pairing as that support choice for the Genji. You jump on in with the Swift Strike. You've got the Emerald Wind to follow things up. You split the team apart. Probably not the map for it, but MVP Black, you can just see the sheer confidence. They lock in that Malfear and the Gul'dan. No hesitation whatsoever. That Gul'dan being high. Not that common in the tournament so far, but on Braxis it has strength. Yes, uh, Gul'dan has barely been picked so far in this tournament. Uh, mages have been picked far less. Li Ming pretty much gets picked to, together with Ana. is the trend mm. that we've seen at this tournament. For the rest, with that Muradin first pick, MVP Black is continuing to draft some of the highest win rate heroes of this tournament. Who are doing the best here? The Haka, Muradin, and Rhaegar. And, and this kind of standard out of MVP Black, it can mean one of two things. Either MVP Black 
doesn't respect team freedom enough to show their pocket strategies, or maybe they have the confidence against any team to repeat the same high win rate heroes over and over until it doesn't work anymore. And you know what I really enjoyed about what we saw from that initial draft phase there was that MVP Black instantly go for that wave clear. They go for the Gul'dan, they go for the Marafurin and saying, look, if this is what they want to do, they want to go for that pushing style of strat. We're going to have ample ways of clearing this out. So yes, you have gone for the ETC. Yes, you've gone for the Genji. You're looking for that all-in kill comp like an early game last time, but we don't know what's going to come around that corner. Tass is still available. Zaya is still available. You've got some ideas to flare it up. I really want to see what MVP Black brings to it, because you have sustained damage in Gul'dan, which is unlike any other on this map. You have Murden, who now with heavy impact at level 7. Oh, by the way, <laughs> there's, you know exactly yeah. where they're going to be, so he's going to get a lot of value. We always used to kind of see the old Stormbolt into Roots. Now you've got heavy impact into Roots far earlier, so your kill potential is going to be there. Gul'dan doesn't necessarily have the burst damage, but he does put out enough to kind of go, but I really feel like maybe that Sake hero will kind of come in that backside and allow the kill potential to be much higher. It feels to me not dissimilar to our Ragnaros pick from our previous game of even if they did manage to wrangle away some of those points where you, you need to control for the Zerg wave to then be strong for you, you have something that's a safety net yes. to be able to clear that very fast and then play the map the normal way you should or you feel you should as the stronger team. Is that fair to say? Uh, very much so. You see a pick like ETC coming in early and Genji who can rotate between top and bottom quickly but Genji is not a true hero until he gets a few notches on his belt. He needs to get a few kills in order to really get his maximum value. So uh, when, you take, uh, when you go up against ETC Genji, and if you are a team like MVP Black, who is very good at the core fundamentals, you want to try and have something that's excellent at defense, and Gul'dan is. I just heard the Braxus holdout ping there, as we'll be getting back into this draft in just a few moments' time as we get things going. Something that you mentioned was the Brightwing that could potentially come with the Genji, but is Lucio still a potential here? Do we see, because Collusion for me, as you guys pointed out, in the br bracket stage, in the group stage even, I should say, that looked like a linchpin for Team Freedom. The argument I'd make for the Lucio would be the fact that there's a lot of self-sustain so far from those three initial picks. You've got Muradin with the third wind, if he goes for that talent route, second wind otherwise. You've got the Malfurion with the sustain, with the uh, the regrowth, the Twilight Dream to interrupt things. You've got the Innovate as well. Uh, same can then apply to Gul'dan. He's going to be looking for that pocket heals, drain heal on demand if need be. Well, back into the draft, we can see how they're going to go for. But the one thing I want to uh, really highlight is that Team Freedom, knowing that they're going to go up against this Gul'dan, knowing they're going to go up against a lot of CC, ETC is very susceptible to CC. If he overcommits, if he thinks he's the one making the play, he could get severely punished. And let's talk about something else. If Brightwing comes out, it's what we call the Brightwing bomb, right? Yep. Teleport to Genji as he dives in to do an Emerald Wind that displaces the entire team of MVP Black. If Malfurion or Gul'dan are on point and they aim their Aria of Effect Silence heroic on that location, they're going to completely sabotage that attempt before it can even truly begin. That's the biggest thing is that I was talking to some players this week and I was told by one player, Gul'dan, or Reset in particular, is the single best player at putting the perfect horrifies down to isolate a hero. And if you ever watch MVP Black play, they will all in on one hero. And that's the biggest thing. Once you get that one pick, the game is far easier. So if we get those isolations and interrupt that, just like you talked about, it could be a very, very tough engage for Freedom. If I'm looking at where Team Freedom go with this one, I actually really like the bands. The bright wing doesn't feel as attractive on Team Freedom's side, but would definitely be, as you were uh, mentioning before, the J-Hal, favorable for MVP Black. Murden jumps and splits the team apart, which they are trying to collapse as one unit. The only reason I probably prefer the Vala over the Greyman is the fact that Greyman needs to jump into that back line. He needs to find those kills, overexert himself. So much CC to meet him at the door. He's not going to have a good time. Yeah, it's dangerous. So maybe you want to deal damage from further away. Yeah. Uh, one option could be Chromie. This could be a direction Team Freedom could go to. Yep. Another thing that could still happen is where Team Freedom says, we're not about the early game ganks or the team fight. We're going to use Genji's level 7 talent, perfect defense, to somehow rush the boss in, in 15 or 10 seconds. This could be part of their strategy, maybe, that they're willing to show here. Akron and Rhaegar come in. And uh, to Grubby's point, of course, Jay Howe, uh, Team Freedom has been known to have a phenomenal Chromie player on their side if they want to go down that path. Wow, Zeratul! Oh. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Okay, solo support Malfurion, pretty rare. And Zeratul, what do you think? The thing that I think about this now is that by committing to the Rhaegar, it's impossible to go into Uther, and this last one has to be damaged. So the Dragon Blade Genji with the Uther is an improbable thing, and it's impossible to run with this composition. So Zeratul is just going to have free reign, get that auto attack, get that four pull onto Genji. Going to have a very, very 
scary player on top of it. I mean, surely they're anticipating a mage being be behind this. And we've seen Zeratul in the past on this map, a la something like Fnatic, be very powerful about the rotations on this map. Yeah, Genji and Zeratul will be the rotation kings here. Whoever can do that better is going to gain their team an edge. But, you know, Chromie isn't out of the equation yet, going up against Zeratul. If you place a time trap at your own feet, you can stop Zeratul before he gets that combo up. It's still an option. You stop time before he can stop time on you. It's a bit of a time warp there, but final pick now. My head hurts now. Thanks, Gibby. <laughs> <laughs> Where do they go? Do they go the Chromie? Yeah. Yes, they do. Excellent choice. Creepy Chromie. Apparently, she'll be rewinding time in World of Warcraft soon, and we'll all get to play Classic again. Yes. I'm very excited <laughs> for that one. But overall, what a choice here for them to go to. We spoke the fact that they do have strength in it in their previous games in the North America HGC. But going up against MVP Black, I think they predicted what was going to be that last pick. The hardest part here in the way this is going to play out, Dahaka does not win the lane against Malthale. And if Zeratul roams up, all of a sudden Dahaka will die. So he's going to have to be very careful on when he chooses to try to contest the beacon, which puts the pressure on your four man. And using a Genji Chromie that doesn't have very good wave clear, Chromie has to now prioritize her W onto the waves, which is very difficult because you're trying to also contest the beacon. I'm afraid in that circumstance that when you have Gul'dan that sustains style damage, they're going to lose that in the long run. I'm really curious to see how strong that four man's going to be in the bot lane. I think the team that wins this is the one that manages the rotations the best. Yeah. There's a lot that can jump up and down. And plus, MVP Black is not incentivized to meet Chromie in the lane because her wave pressure is mediocre. Gul'dan a lot better. So I think we're going to see potentially a lot of rotations by either team to try and get the better end of those, uh, yeah, of, of surprising your opponent in that sense. I think the point for me would be we've seen Rich in that solo lane like to exert himself as the best. And if you are going to be trying to really patch that four man, as you discussed, Gordon, I'm going to be smashing that lane out quite easily. Obviously, you've got Malfurion as well. But if you're not winning that bottom lane, you might see a bit of desperation come out to Dahaga to try and brush Stalker in, try and force a gank, try and get a kill target. If that happens, I mean, Rich just pushes top lane and goes, thank you very much, rotations, rotations, and suddenly we just run away with this game. Well, of course. One more thing. Absolutely. One more thing. No cleanse on the side of MVP Black. Temporal loop on Chromie could set things up for an absolute uh, easy kill. Even though shifting sands is normally the most common thing, they might look to exploit that. Either one works now. Right, right. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. As you guys have been voting, continue to vote who you think is going to be winning in chat with either MVP Black or Team Freedom. At the moment, MVP Black is 1-0 up against the North American team here moving into game number two. Let's head over to the commentary team to find out how it all goes down. The last time we saw a Korean team go to what many would consider a North American map, we saw Roll20 win over Tempest. Do you think MVP Black is in a spot where they could lose against Team Freedom today? I know that Team Freedom wanted to play this map. It was, a, it was one of the concerns that they had, what is going to be banned by MVP, so they practiced the typical North American maps, they practiced Warhead, they practiced Braxis, yeah. they were actually hoping that Black would ban out Warhead and that they get a chance to play on Braxis if at any point they lose. So they are confident here. But then again, the last game was a bit rough. Well, let's see if it pays off here for Team Freedom as we move into game number two on Braxis Holdout as we'll be watching Gold Dan against Chromie. A very exciting matchup in a D. So let's go ahead and move on up into it. Game number two, Kaldor. And another thing that we are going to see is a Rich on Zeratul. And that is something that is absolutely frightening as we are heading into game number two of our first best of three today. Saka on Gold Dan. For the team in blue, to the left, Reset is going to play Malfiel this time. Test, of course, at that front line on Murad, and we have Kyoja on Malfurion. And last but not least, it's Rich on Zeratul. Ladies and gentlemen, MVP Black! On the right side, in the red, leading the pack here, it'll be Collusion on Rhaegar. Zugrug playing the ETC. Cure playing Dehaka. Gonna follow up with Dainsky playing the Genji. And last but not least, Nazmus playing Chromie. It's Team Freedom! It's one of the things that Team Freedom has to do right now, just shake off map number one. It was a bit of a beating, black is strong, we all knew that, but at the same time, they now need to be the ones to just ignore the first map and say, okay, let's just play Braxis, take it one step at a time, get a win here, and carry this to game three.
think I agree with Grubby pretty heavily here that it will come down to the rotations. Where is Genji? Where is Dahaka? Where are they moving here? Kira I'll be watching a lot. He's been doing pretty solid on the Dahaka throughout this tournament. Uh, in terms of rotations and moving in for those combos, he can be great, but the follow-up is important. Nazmus on that Chromie has to make sure to blow up the targets. I really like the mobility that we have for Team Freedom when you look at their draft. Genji excels on this map, and so does, of course, any kind of global pressure that you can put onto your opponent. And with, especially the Haka, but also ETC to an extent, we could see that really coming to play here. The big game changer is Zaratul. Yes. And especially with Muradin, we see Tist and Rich already starting to roam and look for targets. If that Stormbolt hits and later on the stun on 7 for Muradin, then Zaratul can unload all the damage and just snipe these targets in the back line. I remember back in the day when we saw Zaratul for the first time on Brackets Holdout, uh, it was actually Wubby playing this character, jumping around between the map. He had only 12k damage, but in terms of actually controlling the beacons, Zeratul can be wonderful floating around using that stealth mechanic. So, yes, we're going to have to watch and see how Rich will handle his movement throughout the map. Already here, harasses Ugro. Yeah, and they're going straight for ETC once again. A great route, Spy Melt, Pure and Kyoja are laying down the lawn here as they are trying to get the first skill. First blood hits as MVP Black takes down ETC. Chromie combo comes out, but will miss as MVP Black will disperse around from the area. And the first kill of the game, again, going to MVP Black. A direct repeat from what we saw in game number one. And once again, they're trying to go for Nasmus. another kill. Nasma's already a little bit low, but he gets away for now. And here comes once more gold down, but not able to deliver the final sparks of damage here. This will be the issue that Team Freedom will have to solve in the bottom lane. How do they deal with Goldan, who clears up the lane consistently, especially with the battery behind him in that Malfurion? It's definitely going to be rough for Freedom to face that, but they have the tools, and if they play them right, they can definitely put some pressure onto MVP Black. The last few days, all the teams have been screaming their hearts out, practicing the entire time. And if they didn't scrim against other teams, you could see them in Hero League just, just practicing mechanics. And just the coordination and the effort that everybody put in just culminates now on those games that we have here today. And everybody was hyped, everybody was nervous. And you could tell that every team knows anything can happen here, especially with the best of three. But so far, it's MVP Black running the show. Just shutting down Team Freedom. Zugrug in a position where he actually wasn't in too crazy of a movement. But coming in with the engage was Tiss, landing that storm ball, allowing for the blow up to happen. And ETC is now down. Now, looking in the top lane, Reset is starting to get the upper hand on Cure. We're going to have Dancy come in to try and grab that beacon for some time, but MVP Black already ahead here, 26 to 0%. Tis just waiting for him and immediately hitting that Stormball, putting the pressure on Genji. And talking Stormballs, we have a very Korean build here for Muradin, once again specking into Perfect Storm on level 1, just to supply that little bit more extra damage that you get if you're trying to blow up a target. And that's something they've been constantly trying to do throughout the game. And as you said before, the eye ahead right now in the beacon progress, it's Team Freedom that needs to try and do to somehow control these points. I mean, that Stormbolt build is wonderful, especially gets likes of Chromie or even Genji landed there and get that damage on them. They have low health pool, so going for a little bit of extra damage can pay off. Now, Team Freedom has been doing their best in terms of rotations. They're making an aggressive one here on the bottom side, and they're looking for Kyocha. Kyocha knows he's in trouble. He's trying to back out. Can Kier hit this drag? He does, and Team Freedom gets their first kill of the series. Team Freedom, they get the kill, but it's an again ETC who's Zagrana. in trouble, trying to move away here. Gul'dan wants the kill, but the heals is in as Skill Illusion saves his tank. Illusion helping out, but look in the top lane. That trade comes at a cost. We have Malfiel constantly pushing in here. Another combo coming out. Not going to quite connect, but in the top lane, Malfiel pushing as aggressively as he can. Luckily for Team Freedom, Kira is able to get up here just in time to grab that experience. So a good trade for them. And you know, even Zeratul in a bit of trouble at the bot lane as all of a sudden Chromie comes in with the Bronze Talons and just delivers all that damage. But the fight is not stopping again. Chromie on a bit of pressure, but great moves by Nazmas as they are trying to put the pressure on to Rich in particular, but they're going for Tiss first here. Murden in trouble. Dainsky on the other hand with a quick deflect. He dies, he goes down, and Rich survives. Rich getting the trade there, going straight to the top lane as well. Wants to help out with Malfiel, trying to make sure that they grab all the beacon progress. And it looks like they may just be able to do so if they can grab the bottom side. Gonna have Tiss moving on in while at the same time, Rich comes from behind. They're looking at Zugro. They go in, they get him down low. Can he survive? Yes, he does, but the beacon goes over to MVP Black. Go down, go Goes down, Freedom with another kill. Here comes the move against ETC, but the cleanse is there. Now Rich has a problem. He's trying to move away. Chromie doesn't deliver the damage, but it's a five on five. And Kyocha is in trouble. Kyocha goes down. Five versus three on the bot lane. And Meltdale dies as well. Team Freedom 
with kill after kill against MVP Black. And those kills were important. Now Team Frito can set up and try to defend this big Zerg wave that was pushing on the bottom side. Rich versus Dansky though here in the middle lane. Dansky kind of backwards trying his best to stay alive, but Tiss jumps in to ruin the party. <laughs> Dansky, he goes in, he's trying just to get out. No! Rich jumps forward and gets the kill. Dansky doing his best here and nearly taking down Rich, but then Murden comes in and puts him down. At this point, Team Freedom still defending against the Zerg wave here. They're doing well thus far. They hit level eight even a little bit faster than their opponents. Much better than game number one oh, already yeah. here for Team Freedom. Finding a little bit of composure, getting some confidence, even a little bit of head and experience matching against MVP Black. At this point in game number one, we were a full level behind here for Team Freedom. They gotta be feeling great about this one. What I absolutely love about what Freedom is doing here, and not intimidated. Just think about it, last map, not a single kill, a five level difference at the end of the game, and they come out swinging on map number one. They're saying, we are here to fight, and we are going in, and we are gonna show everything we have, not intimidated whatsoever. And the game plan here is to blow up a target. Grubby brought it up in the analysis. No cleanse available for MVP Black, so Team Freedom grabbing Temporal Loop. And talking about no cleanse, you know, Malfurion as a solo healer is a bit of a risk. Most teams would not run this. Most of the time when we see Malfurion, it's in a double support composition. He offers it a lot of utility, but especially with the setup that MVP Black is running here, Malfurion can be a liability if that on-point damage hits, and that's where Temporal Loop comes into play. I love how MVP Black is playing this, so they realize Temporal Loop is up and available, and they immediately on the battleground get safe, and they only put pressure where they know Chromie is not. Chromie showed herself in the bottom lane, so they put three in the top. But they're also keeping Murden in a spot where he can interrupt Chromie when she goes for that combo. Great response here from MVP Black. I talked to Team Freedom before the series started at the Curtains, and they said we're going to make an A crowd today. We're not sure if we can beat MVP Black, but we are going to give everything we have to take them on. And currently they're doing exactly that on the second map here. It's only half a level, and they will hit level 10, where we are going to see the mid-game start with the heroic abilities. Stansky floating around on the middle side. Rich and Tess will find him, so have to jump away. That level 10 getting closer and closer for both of our teams. Team Freedom with an ounce of a lead here. And as the walls start to fall for MVP, Black making it much easier for them to tie it up. And this is great, 10 hitting for both our teams when the beacon progress is about to pop up. Talking about Perfect Storm just for a moment, we have 13 stacks currently on the talent, meaning that we have 65 extra damage per hit on the side of Muradin. Tist hasn't completed his quest talent, obviously, but he's very close to doing that as well. Only missing four more Storm Balls, nine actually, my bad, to complete the quest talent. And then, of course, hitting another power spike with Muradin. Gonna be very helpful. Also, we can get Team Freedom Isolation. Has been chosen for Cure. A wonderful ability against Malfield. He goes in for the engage, get the isolation before he puts his tormented souls. Or even Malfurion, making sure to land it before Twilight Dream does connect. ETC in the middle, once again getting caught here, being able to get that resistance up. Great pull offs on the yeah. other hand by MVP Black here. Temporal loop. Here comes the temporal loop. They're trying to get the kill, but they don't miss the time perfectly. There's the Mosh Pit that doesn't hit, gets interrupted as well. Dainsky in trouble. The Ancestral comes through, but Cure is completely split from the rest of the team, and he is not going to survive this one. Tist is going to hold a final Storm Ball just in case, and there's the final damage. Cure is going to fall, and that's a double kill for MVP Black. Uncharacteristic there for Team Freedom. Usually when it comes to execution, it's one of the things that they do do well when you're looking at their check marks. but they did not get the actual timing down. They were trying to set up the Dansky diving forward with Genji to get the damage, and of course, the Mosh Pit. Yeah, Dansky missed here. The Mosh Pit was not as good as we would like here, and that's situation for them. They actually talked a lot about how they feel team fight is really where they excel. It's mm -hmm. their tool that they want to bring to this game to show MVP Black that they can trade in these fights. And so far that hasn't quite happened. Black immediately capitalized on the mistakes and got the double kill. But Freedom is still very much in the run here. We have MVP Black with a massive lead when it comes to beacon progress. But looking at experience, they're still very close. And more importantly, we're on the same talent level. Bit behind, though, in beacon progress. But another thing that Team Freedom has available for them, remember, always the boss sheets that can occur as well with that Genji. So there are tools here for Team Freedom. But it's starting to look a little bleak here as MVP Black is definitely getting some momentum. They take the four on the bottom side and they're controlling the top. Another Another combo missing there from Dainsky. Another combo missed, and uh, Freedom has suffered a lot on the last double kill against them. Right now, they are, of course, aiming for a bit of control through the beacons. But Black is happy to just trade evenly here and go for level 13. And once they hit that power spike, they will try and push the agenda. Yeah, they have no reason to force this beacon progress. First off, they're already ahead. And second off, they have wonderful wave clear between Malvio and Gold Dan. On the bottom side, though, Kira's in trouble, and he gets destroyed there as a Fellflame comes in. Kira actually did really, really well here trying 
to escape, oh. but he's not able to do it. Rich, on the other hand, might get out here, but that was a great shot on the side of Chromie. Not enough damage, though, to take Zeratul down, but it got very close. That's right. Rich there playing with sand as Nathus comes in with a combo, <laughs> getting a shot there. At the same time, though, Reset coming on the back right. They're looking for a fight. Tormented Souls will be popped. Dancy can jump away. Zubway trying to come on in, but Collusion, not so lucky. He's going to get picked off on the bottom side. He throws the Ancestral out just before he goes down. Stagger Deaths now coming in. Nazmas is falling. They go for ETC. He's trying to move away. The drag dragging him away from the tank. You are saving Zogrog for now. Delivering some extra damage against Zerit tool, but MVP Black, they have the two-level lead, they have the talent advantage, and they have the Zerg Wave. And they're pushing in a lane that Zerg Wave is not even in. The Zerg Wave is in the top lane. They're taking this Hellbat and Wave Push, and they're pushing the bottom keep wall and opening it up here against Team Freedom. Now, with Team Freedom spawning, they're gonna go ahead and rotate towards the top side, but MVP Black, with a full talent lead and the map opening up, are looking great. And we talked about how especially Malfurion can be vulnerable. Now he has Ice Block, so that's another great tool that he can use once he's in trouble. It gives his team a bit of time to really help out and come to his assistance. Freedom still trying to defend here up at the top, but Black is now pushing in with that talent advantage we've been talking about earlier. And in an ideal world for the Korean team, they would get the keep here. Now, with Malfurion off the table as a temporal loop combo because of that ice block, there are still three juicy targets that Team Freedom can go for. Malfiel, Zeratul, and Goldam. But they have to execute on the combo that they have failed to do twice in a row. For now, they have to clear the top lane, and this is where their composition hurts. Zeratul going up against the Hawk at the bot lane. Well, so we see the defense up here at the top. ETC in trouble. They the cleanse comes in. Reset wants the kill, doesn't get it. Now but here win. comes Tist. Oh, they're gonna miss out there with Kuromi getting hit there with the Horrified. She could not follow up the combo. MVP Black identifying the weakness of Team Freedom. They continue to push on in, and Nazis will be able to get away, but already two targets are down here for Team Freedom. Will they push in and start going for core? ETC dove in deep. He wanted the triple mosh pit, but he didn't get it. He got blown up within an instant. MVP Black, they have taken the keep down and pushed even further, thinking for a second about taking the core. And Rich, in the meantime, takes down Q at the bottom of the map, barely surviving. But the end result is he still <laughs> lives and he got the kill. That's right, Rich living here. Three levels over Team Freedom. And again, it's starting to look like a replay of the last game here for Team Freedom. They have to find a way to get back in this match. Maybe a boss rush is one of the ways to do it. Force a fight against MVP Black as things are not looking very good for them. At this point, you really have to think, okay, what do we do? Do we have the time to actually sit there and wait for 16? Do we go for boss and throw a Hail Mary and just Ooh. YOLO it? They're, They're trying to isolate Zeratul first of all and they might get it. They go in once more. Rich is trying to juke them as much as he can. He might get away here, but no, Illusion confirms the kill, and now Tiss might be in trouble too. Team Freedom makes a moment happen for them here. They're going for Tiss. The combo comes out. Dragon Blade being used like Math Life. Will go ahead. You come with the souls. He's here hitting we everyone, go. though. They're getting low. Team Freedom has three kills. Can they get a fourth? Socket! He will fall. Kyoto, the only one to leave, but they don't care about it. Let's go to boss. All of a sudden, Team Freedom is back. They get the kill against Rich as he's isolated on the map, and then we be black makes a mistake. They go in and they lose another three members. Now Boss is being taken here. Stream Freedom is trying to come back into this. And here we go, a replay. The combo comes in. The Dragon Blade hitting two members. It looks scary for Team Freedom, but the Ancestor healing connected. And Zogrug was able to power slide forward. Dave can get the kill, and that's when they move forward to grab the Boss. And now the comeback is available for Team Freedom. They are one and a half levels behind, but they're only one level away from level 16. They have a fighting chance. It's 12 kills against eight in this game. It's all about the rotations here once again. And Freedom, we talked about it earlier. They are relying heavily on these rotations, on the Haka, on Genji, on ETC, just the mobility on the map, and it's something they're going to use here. And especially with ETC now also completing Brock Rock, it's another power spike for them and gives them a little bit more sustainability during the team fights. Black is being very careful here. They want to wait for all five members to pop up. Finally, with Tish showing up, they're going to be able to kill off the boss. And talking about being careful, it's actually Team Freedom who immediately moves back. They leave the boss going for the fort. They're not even forcing the issue because they say, guys, let's not fight. Wait for 16. Play this safe. Don't go in too eagerly and then fall. We have a chance here to come back. Let's use it. Good control there from Team Freedom. Doing one risk and then realizing when they have to pull themselves back in the game and stay grounded. Now, the beacon phase starts for both of our teams, and we're going to have Team Freedom controlling the top side here. It's one for one on the beacons. MVP Black is sharking around as they want to fight. And the top keep has, of course, fallen, so Freedom needs to be careful. But they have the globals. They have the mobility. They can send heroes top, but they have to always be careful of Zeratul. The fight starting down at the 
bot lane once again. Zeratul taking over the beacon up at the top. And Black, therefore, also very hesitant to take the fight since they need Zeratul to join with them. Yeah, Team Freedom, they had an instance where they could have forced a fight. And you saw Nazareth looking for a squishy. But the moment that Zeratul continued to disappear, they went ahead and pulled away. Tiss does take some damage here. Reset gets on the back line. They turn around with the isolation, but ETC has fallen. ETC is down, and here comes the Void play once again. They're going in. The silence hit the isolation. But it's Freedom who's low. Freedom about to lose Chromie here, and that's not the only hero that goes down. Denji dies as well, and we have two heroes trying to defend the core as MVP Black starts moving straight for a 2-0 victory. With five heroes and a couple of catapults, they run straight for the core. Can they make it a 2-0 against Team Freedom? It's looking like it as Collusion is wanting to slow down that back line, but with many seconds available here for Team Freedom. 10, 20 for the Genji and the Chromie. The defense looks like it's not going to be available. Collusion doing his best here to 1v1 Kyocha, but the rest of the members for MVP Black are on the core, and it's dropping. MVP Black is going for the Team Freedom. He's losing game number two as the Korean team takes the series with a 2-0 victory and moves up to the semifinal. MVP Black came into this tournament feeling confident, studying their opponents, ready to go and rearing up against any member that would want to face off against him. And now with this 2-0 over Team Freedom, we will see them in the semifinals tomorrow. But Team Freedom, they came out and they put up a heck of a fight. Team Freedom, they knew from the start that it would be very rough going up against MVP Black, a team that has been hailed as the favorite in this tournament ever since we saw them in the group stage. The European teams have talked about it when they went to Korea and started scrimming against the Korean teams, how much they have improved since the mid-season brawl and of course the Eastern Clash. And we can see that right in front of us as Team Freedom throws everything at them. But the coordination that we have on the side of MVP Black is just too much to handle. MVP Black looking like a scary opponent for anyone that will have to match up against them for the rest of the tournament. But for now, they've made it to tomorrow. They can relax, prepare, and study for tomorrow's matches, and it will be a wonderful time seeing them play. But Team Freedom, again, you gotta give them a round of applause. They came out here, and they did their best against their opponents, making it the top eight. That's what they set for expectations. They were hoping to maybe make a mark and go to the top semifinals. Sadly, that did not work out for them, but you gotta love the heart. Yeah, and when we talk about MVP Black, we of course that they want the title. They said we want to go to the finals. Last year it didn't work out as they expected. This year they want to redeem themselves and they might have a shot. Now of course we have an interview with the winner, so let's hear what they have to say about that victory against Team Freedom where they took it 2-0. Thank you so much, Caldor. That's right, I'm here with the captain of MVP Black, Sake. Congratulations on a dominant performance here at, on the BlizzCon stage. You must be feeling very confident. Uh, I want to ask you, what is the difference in your team's mentality now at, that you're at the Global Finals than it was in the mid-season? You seem so much stronger, both in your play and in your mental game. What is making the difference for you? 먼저 우승 축하드립니다. 그리고 그 지금 현재 BlizzCon 스테이지에서 게임을 하고 계시는데요. 그 현재 시즌 시즌 중간에서부터의 지금 생각하시는 방법이랑 게임하는 방법이랑 지금 불컨에 오셔가지고 게임 방법이 좀 많이 좀 자신감이 넘치는 것 같은데 혹시 그 이유가 어떤 건지 좀 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 어 일단 코치 노블레스가 있다는 것만으로도 충분한 그런 저희에게 활력이 되는 것 같고 또 간만에 오는 무대이기도 하고. 이번에는 꼭 우승하겠다라는 마음을 다 갖고 있기 때문에 다들 평소보다 더 잘하는 것 같아요. The biggest difference would be Nobles well, having him as a coach and supporting us throughout BlizzCon. And second is just that we want to win so bad and for the finals. That's why I think we're mentally more prepared. Awesome, so great to hear. And on that note, what is it like for you and your team to be back here on the BlizzCon stage, feeling the energy of the crowd? What does that mean to you? 다시 블리스컨 이제 무대에 진출하셨는데요. 거기에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시나요? 어 이렇게 많은 사람들 앞에서 게임 해보는 게 굉장히 오랜만인 것 같아요. 그래가지고 기분도 좋고 나름 또 작년에 저희가 졌거든요. 그래가지고 이번에는 꼭 우승하겠다라는 기분을 항상 갖고 있어요. 그리고 아, 그리고 이제 다음 경기가 디니타스랑 이스포트인데. 디니타스가 꼭 올라와가지고 저희랑 미드 시즌 리벤지를 제가 꼭 했으면 좋을 것 같아요. Uh, it's been a very long time since we played in a large audience, and we we're very excited, and uh, we really want to win. Second, uh, for the next matchup we we're gonna face, uh, I wish Dignitas will come up, 
so we can take revenge on our midseason that we lost. Awesome. Everyone loves a good revenge story. Well, Sake, I'll let you go get ready for that next match. And of course, I hope you get uh, the revenge match as well. Congratulations on your victory. Good luck. All right, guys, that is Sake, captain of team MVP Black. Let's head over to the desk and get a few more thoughts here from Kailaris and crew. That's right, dominant fashion here from MVP Black as they go 2-0 against Team Freedom. Pretty clean cut for the most part, although there were moments in that second game, Grubby, where Team Freedom did gather some momentum, I guess, against a not-so-common composition from MVP Black. Yeah, I mean, this, this was, in a big way, MVP Black, uh, Rich's show, Zero Tool. Yeah. Uh, also, Tist. TTSST, uh, his, his anchoring, which is where you stand in a bush or you check a dangerous point of contention, and then you protect that area as your team's warrior, his anchoring was out of this world. But Team Freedom, they came swinging from a surprise corner a few times here, and uh, we shall remember those moments. Even though Team Freedom lost here, they had a few really cool moments. Very difficult to go up against somebody like MVP Black, of course, Skimmy. Team Freedom, though, and overall for them, as we said, it wasn't all lost in that game. They did get themselves some kills, but MVP Black looked so strong. I mean, we knew it was going to be a tough game from the get-go of this series, but in that game specifically, we even looked at a draft and thought, hmm, there's going to be a few scary moments here, wave clear lacking in the bottom lane, the uh, ability to try and win that 1v1 matchup in that top lane. But they showed signs of life, right? Especially that fight, 16 to 14. <laughs> You're down a talent to you're down those all-important levels, but you're still showing that, hey, Chrome, you can one-shot no matter what phase of it. And that's uh, something to be proud of when you're going up against the world's elite. Grubby, I believe you picked out some highlights for us, or a highlight. Yeah, Team Freedom had a really cool moment early in the game that uh, really helped them get back in the game. As we just look at the setup here, and we roll it forward slowly. Uh, we just pause it for a second here. We look at MVP Rich. He was initially zoned out by the time trap there. But as soon as he is cleared up, he jumps in there. Now, very key talent, Seeker in the dark. Level 7 talent for Zeratul. Him. As we roll it forward slowly, he's going to use that, get in on ETC, and do some big damage. But as we pause it here for a second, this is the power. This thing right here, the Haka, burrowing in from Team Freedom. Now, this always comes at a penalty. Right now, there is no one in the top lane for Team Freedom. As we roll it forward, there is no one in the top lane. But if they can get a kill, it's worth it. Now, Rhaegar and Cure will get that kill there together. And then we look at this moment here. Rich, he jumps in, he tries to confirm the kill on ETC. And we pause it here for a second. Because Rich just teleported in with Vorpal Blade. He used his level one talent to get in and try and kill ETC. Collusion's cleanse was too good. Now Zeratul is in an impossible position. He's nearly dead. We see him here, the whole team rounding out on him. But he finds a way. Look at this. Zeratul will go from here. Onto the, ha onto the Haka with Seeker in the dark and will then blink away in a really cool way. Watch this escape because this is what Team Freedom was up against. We start playing it, Rich on Zerto. Crazy, boom, boom. Teleported away so fast. Now this ends up resulting in a really cool fight for Team Freedom where they get additional kills as we roll it at full speed here. And uh, we see a number of more kills. Very nice Dragon's Eye there by Chromie. And now they can lead to that yeah. defense. But this kind of zero tool play, I mean, it, it's just insane. Yeah, it could have hi it highlighted that they could have got a whole lot more from that if it wasn't for some of the skills that Rich uh, showed there, Jay Howe. Yeah, Rich uh, obviously does what Rich does, and it's kill people pretty phenomenally and sometimes in spectacular fashion. And the whole thing about this strategy, Braxis, that's why I said I was very curious how Freedom would be able to handle that, because you're basically committing to skirmishing and team fighting for the majority of the game against the single best team fighting in the game without a shadow of a doubt. And in the end, MVP Black, they took the last team fight. They were already ahead. We saw some moments where Freedom looked good, and then they ended up dropping that last team fight, which is what MVP Black does best. We said it at the end of the group stage, can anyone extract from MVP Black anything from this moving forwards? I'm going to ask you guys again. Do you think anyone really extracts anything of worth from uh, MVP Black here? I mean, they showed the standard picks here that worked really well for them, standard and stable. Yeah. I feel like MVP Black has shown nothing that they hadn't already shown in the group stage. And furthermore, I feel like MVP Black soundly defeated Team Freedom in the drafting as uh, Team Freedom, they've been banning out supports the entire tournament, 10 out yeah, of 20 yeah. support bans. And I just feel like, the strength of MVP Black is residing in Tist and in Reset and in Rich, the Warriors and the Assassin players here. Mm. Support is 
for them the support role. Big players are coming from their front line. So to remove Ariel Brightwing, I don't think Team Freedom reached the correct formula in dealing right. with a team like Black yet. Gimme. I mean, if anything, that game showed us that double support can obviously not be played from time to time. Single support on both sides. There was no cleanse. You only have the Malfurion to rely on. We're discussing all oh, men. Is this a little bit too greedy? Is this a bit of fan service to them saying, look, we can just style on opponents like NA? I mean, they show us that they've done their preparation. They've done their research. They know what to go against. And drafting has always been their biggest sort of sound strength. So hard to try and tackle them in the, in the draft, hard to try and tackle them on the battlefield. What angle do you do actually approach them at? I, I just want to say this. We can talk about MVP Black, and we'll have plenty of opportunities going forward. Absolutely. But Team Freedom, I want to put this into perspective, because Collusion moved over from tank to support. When we had a chance to talk to him, he said, I was pretty garbage at the beginning of the year, and his play has stepped up. We saw Nazmus, who's basically been a standout player for me. And this team from Team Freedom, Cure coming over, known as a ranged assassin, now moved over to that melee role. We have players that are learning new roles, coming into the professional scene, coming into their first BlizzCon. I want to say this team, I said it before the second Western Clash when they started to qualify. So this guy, this team has a lot of potential still. I think we'll see a bright future for this team. I think they did really well. They just ran into, well, MVP Black. MVP yeah. Black. Very well, well said. Of course, that is Team Freedom, who unfortunately for them, their road through 2017 HGC comes to an end. However, MVP Black, a former champion, plods on. We'll be back in just a few moments time with Europe going up against Europe. the void play once again they're going in the silence in the isolation but it's freedom who's low freedom about to lose chromie here and that's not the only hero that goes down genji dies as well and we have two heroes trying to defend the core as mvp black starts moving straight for a 2-0 victory with stun clash and we can see that right in front of us as team freedom throws everything at them but the coordination that we have on the side of mvp The 2017 Heroes Global Championship Finals are brought to you in part by Republic of Gamers, Intel, T-Mobile, and NVIDIA. We came to this world as exiles and outcasts, but together, we can be more. A weapon to break the chains of oppression. A bastion for the hunted and the lost. A family bound by blood and honor. And if our enemies do not give us peace, we will give them war! Ah! Victory or death! This I pledge as your war chief. Until the end of days, 